I like your background, Jason. Oh, was, thank you. <laughs> if there was uh if you know that Twitter account Room Raider where they rate mm -hmm. your uh your backgrounds, you'd you'd get at least a nine, I would say. You think so? Good. I think so. Yeah, this is just the room that I happen to be in. So Are you uh, I'm glad that it looks good. Yeah, I mean how I have a, a, a barn uh on the property that looks kind of like a German rock and roll club inside. So that's where I tend to do my zooms. You should be on Zillow gone wild as well. I know. Yeah. That <laughs> one's one of my, that's one of my favorites, the insides of people's houses. Wow. Yeah. I always like the ones where it's like on the outside, it looks like a completely normal house. And then inside it's like a Darth Vader bowling alley or something yeah. like that. Completely, completely bonkers like that. It's definitely the themes. The people who stick with the theme for their whole house is amazing. Like there's nothing that I would want to live in constantly. There's no <laughs> like pop culture thing that I would just want to immerse myself in when I got home. It's pretty awesome. I feel this background because, you know, I watch Running With My Eyes Closed and like there's, uh, you know, scenes in it where you had to sort of like do the Zoom performances or the virtual performances. And that was like kind of a bummer for you because reunions was out at the time but you never did it in this room from what i recall i don't think so not facing this direction i think actually we may have done it facing that way because there's a stage in front of me nice. uh, that we use for a lot of things but um we try i was trying really hard in those days to be outside you know because i just felt like if i stayed indoors um, I would be even more depressed than I already was. And uh, yeah. so we did a lot of that stuff outside on the porch. Well, obviously, thankfully, a lot has changed since that time when you were making that movie because, you know, now you can tour again and you have a new album out, Weather Veins. But I guess this is a good entry point for me to ask you, you know, that movie, uh, Running With Our Eyes Closed, it just recently came out, even though you were making it in like 2019, 2020. So how in any way is this album coming out just like one or two months later, sort of a companion piece or a sequel to that <laughs> project, you know, because they sort of, you know, I mean, obviously there's a recurring theme that goes throughout your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me, I am in all of it, um, uh, playing the same character every time. <laughs> so I guess they're all, it's like the Fast and the Furious. There's like a dozen of them now. Um, uh you know, we had a better time this this record, and I think a big part of that was me just being able to admit to myself that um, making an album causes me some stress and some anxiety. And once I said it out loud and, and recognized it for what it was, it, it freed me up to enjoy my experience a little bit more. That usually works that way, though. You know, most of the time it's kind of like the the monster in the closet you know if you open up the closet door and look in the closet then the monster is not really there anymore it's like uh schrodinger's problem um <laughs> schrodinger's emotional issue once you acknowledge that it's a real thing uh it disappears in a lot of ways um yeah so that we we had some fun we just went in the studio and we we sort of played with the toys and worked the machines and you know i came in with um a bunch of songs already written and already finished and and that made it possible for us to enjoy ourselves when you say uh when i asked sort of about like you're you're referencing a sort of sense of of joy or or more lightness that came with this record did any of that come from kind of knowing uh in the back of your mind that like hey we'll actually be able to tour this record we'll actually be able to play it live i will not be doing zoom performances in mm -hmm. in your in your german rock and roll club you'll be doing like actual <laughs> touring which you know i know was a bummer with when reunions came out yeah yeah we were very excited and it probably i would imagine informed some of the writing for this record too i think i think probably in the back of my mind i was thinking okay i'm gonna actually get to go out and play these songs for people when it's released so mm -hmm. uh yeah i'm gonna write some songs that are gonna be fun to play for people um yeah, it's 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 strange because it's like I toured for so many years before the pandemic happened, you know, almost 20 years at that point. And um then once it was taken away from me, it just it it was it was devastating, you know. And and before that I was complaining, I'm tired, this tour is too long, I want to go home, blah, blah, blah. And I don't complain about those things anymore. I'm sure it'll creep back in, you know, five or six years from now, I'll be, I'll be bitching about the, 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 the sandwich meat on the rider again, but for now, <laughs> trying to for fold now, it. Well, yeah, to fold yeah. It. 
Yeah, or, or it's sweaty. You know, sometimes the, the cheese gets sweaty. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I don't mind that now as much as I used to. And and uh, yeah, being in the studio and making these uh, songs happen, I do think it was more fun knowing that we would be out there playing them for real live human beings again. Yeah, that's for sure. So you mentioned that every album comes with you know, stress and anxiety. The documentary, of course, detailed that. Does your stress and anxiety come at all from the fact that you get, you know, you have story songs and, and kind of fictional songs, but you get very confessional on your records, you know. Is that, does that contribute to the stress that you're like about to put something, something out there again for all the world to hear? Yeah, yeah, probably so. I mean, when you when you tie your work and your personal life together so much and so closely, I believe in it. I believe it's the right thing to do for me because I think that that's the way that I connect with people. Uh, and I think that, you know, if, if somebody hears a song and you're very specific about the details of your experience and it makes sense to them, then they sort of feel like, you know, a secret. And they're like, how did he know this about my life, you know, and that's the best for me. I would rather do that than than appeal in a in a vague way to a large number of people. So I think it's the best way to go about it, but it is uh, a little bit dangerous because you know you start to think, well, if people don't like this record, does that mean they don't like me? They don't like my mm. my inner life or my emotions or who I am. Um, and yeah, you have to acknowledge that and you have to to continue to move forward. Um, and you know, it's it's just like everything else. It never turns out to be as bad as you expect it to be. <laughs> Is there ever any time it could be on this record that just came out, or it could be in the past and all your other great records where you've maybe not regretted, maybe that's not the right word, but once it was out there, you're kind of like, should I have said that? Should I have, you know, should I have released that song? Is there ever any kind of remorse, even if it's temporary? Um not really. No. Um, you know, because the process of turning it into a song gives you a whole lot of opportunities to consider what you're saying mm -hmm. and who you're who you're singing about, whether it's you or somebody else that's, you know, in your personal sphere that that might not have signed up for being in a song. Um if if you spend enough time working on the lyrics and working on the melodies, you're gonna also just by default spend a lot of time thinking, do I want this to be out in the world? And then by the time it's mixed and mastered and released, you should be pretty settled with it, I think. You know, I, I remember hearing like a Leonard Cohen talk about, you know, the Chelsea Hotel and how he 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 told he told people that it was about Janice later and wished he hadn't done that. I think that's an easier mistake to make. It's like mm. because when he was spending the time working on that song, he constructed it in a way where it wouldn't be obvious. Um, but then he couldn't resist the temptation later on of saying, and this is who I wrote that about, and that's what he regretted. I think I think that's the thing. You don't spend as much time editing your your interviews and your public uh, statements about these songs. Um, so you kind of have to make a, a list for yourself of rules. These are the things that I'll say. These are the things that I want before mm. you go into that. Well, we'll see what rules you uh, adhere to as this interview continues yeah, on. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> How do you feel uh, when the tables are turned, so to speak, when, you know, uh, your wife, Amanda, like Take It Like Amanda, obviously goes into a lot of your marriage and, and her point of view of, of things about your relationship? Like when the tables are turned and you're being sung about or written about, how does that sit with you? You know, I would rather hear it in a song than a Dear John letter, I'll tell you that. I mean, <laughs> and I think for people like us, sometimes those are the only two options. It's like, if we can't figure out a way to get it out in our art or creative life, then it'll fester. Mm. Um, and, you know, my rule is, if it's a good song, you know, it deserves to exist. Um I think everybody should be allowed to access those feelings and to talk about them. And, um, you know, sometimes, yeah, a, a certain line will come across and I'll think, Ooh, that stings a little bit, but you know, it's a good line. So I can't really argue. That's what you get. You marry a, a songwriter, you know, you better be prepared for that kind of stuff. Is there a line that comes to mind from a, uh, I guess from take it like Amanda, her most recent record that what made you do that wincing thing? Um, 
No, I don't remember one in particular. No, uh, I think there's there's plenty. If you go back and listen to it, you could think. But uh, you know, the wince is always followed, especially on on that record. The the wince was always followed by appreciation for for you know her her mastery of the craft. And mm-hmm. like I say, if 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 you uh, can't be comfortable with somebody expressing themselves in the way that that they feel safe express it you know if, if if it's not safe for them to say those things in a song or a poem or a story or whatever it is that they create then you you know you're going to get it in a different version and you're not going to like that version nearly as much absolutely maybe more couples should write songs about i mean other. really right no kidding even if they're not uh all that good at it or practiced at it i think i think right you know when i was a kid being my parents would fight my mom would write letters you know, and sometimes she would, most of the time she wouldn't give them to anybody. She would just write them for herself. And that's helpful. You know, that that's helpful because you get your feelings down on a piece of paper and you can look at them and you can think, well, why might I feel this way? Or this is real. I can read it. And now that I, you know, get it out of, out of my own brain and onto a sheet of paper, I can, I can look at it and know that it's real. I think that's helpful for everybody. I know in the documentary running with our eyes closed, they, you showed how you sort of, you know, kind of Amanda's part of the vetting process, or, you know, you said something, I'm paraphrasing, but something like if she approves of it, then, you know, you know, you're on to something or whatever. Do you, do you do that in general, the two of you back and forth, particularly with like these kind of songs we're talking about the ones that might make you wince, or do you hear those kind of songs once it's a fait accompli and like it's already out or recorded or whatever, what's the? Oh no, we I'm... always hear each other's songs first, always. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the only way to do it, really. You know, um, because we trust each other's opinions, and also uh, it wouldn't be fair to spring something like that on your significant other at the same time <laughs> you're releasing it to the world. You know. <laughs> yeah, uh, you hit you hit the Spotify play, and you're like, oh shit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we wouldn't do that. I mean, we do care. We care a lot about each other. So yeah. even if we're, you know, our our system is, I think, if this were to happen, if if I were to write a song and she was in it and she didn't like the content, then we would sit down and talk about that. And if I, okay. you know, if I had worked hard enough on the song and believed enough in the song to to defend it uh, uh, in that conversation, then it would stand and it would stay. But but I'm not going to just you know, put one out to the world and that's the first time she hears it. Oh no, no, that would not be a good idea. <laughs> how is, you know, the reaction, how did you feel once the documentary came out and then two part question, the reaction to the public? I just recently, I watched the documentary like two nights ago again, to sort of like have it fresh in my mind for this interview. And, you know, it's a great documentary, but definitely like similar to your songwriting it, you know, it doesn't, you know, pull any punches. It's, it's, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of couples or just people in general who wouldn't like kind of go there the way you did in this documentary. How did it feel once that stuff was out, especially since that was uh, presumably like filmed like three or ish years ago. Mm-hmm. So like probably situation is different than your life. Yeah. Different. Yeah, definitely. Thankfully, um, you know, we had some, some uh, breakthroughs, you know, after that point. And, you know, Amanda said when we watched it the first time, she said, I wish we could have just put like a disclaimer on the end that said, everything's fine now, you know, <laughs> that would be, that would be nice. Because it has been a long time ago when we filmed all that stuff. Um, yeah. You know, there was relief uh, because I watched it and I thought, you know, this just seems human to me. This doesn't seem like me or anybody else is doing anything uh, horrible or hurtful. Um uh, but also it's hard to watch because when we, you know, when we survive something, whether it's a difficult time in a relationship or, you know, just any kind of depression or stress or anything like that, um, we don't tend to carry that along the path with us. You know, I think normally the tendency is, okay, I made it through that. I'm going to sit it down over here and keep on going. And so it was, it was a little bit, um, difficult to see the first time just because it's like oh I remember feeling like that you know and uh, I remember making other people feel like that um but then to be sitting there and watching it and be in a different place you know you have to look at it from that perspective and think hey look look what we survived you know look what our relationship survived and and what our creative careers survived 
So there was nothing triggering about it uh, in terms of bringing up old resentments or anything like that. No, you know, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was it was kind of the opposite. I mean, I think we do a pretty good job of actually working all the way through things once we figure out what the problem is you know meaning like me and amanda or me and my band or whatever i think once we figure out what the issue is we kind of we kind of you know work through it until it's completely dissolved um mm -hmm. so then when we go back and see that we're like boy that sucked when we couldn't figure that one out that was tough you know um being disconnected in that way was really hard uh but since then yeah i i don't think it brought any bad stuff back up it just reminded us of what we have to be grateful for now. I imagine you might have some stories of, of fans who either told you this on social media or when they met you or whatever that, you know, people who might have been going through their own relationship struggles who were really kind of grateful to see you show your uh, humanness as a yeah. couple in that. Do you have any stories like that about anyone's like this? You saved my marriage, or <laughs> anything like yeah, that. I mean, there were a lot of people who who said stuff like that, you know, and and I mean, that's kind of the the whole reason why we did it and why we did it the way that we did and didn't, you know, uh, cut anything or tell Sam Jones, the director, that we weren't comfortable with it. Um, I mean, I wasn't comfortable with it, you know, but at the same time, I'm not supposed to be comfortable. Being comfortable is not the ultimate goal. Um, you know, for me, it, it served the purpose that a lot of the songs serve, which is just to really, truly connect with people on a level that makes them feel like they're not alone in their experience. And to do that, you know, and 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 to really dig in and and hit somebody in a in a in a serious place, you have to show yourself and you have to show your flaws. And uh, yeah, it it seemed to appeal to a whole lot of people. You know, more than a lot of music documentaries that are just promotional you know, where the artist is paying for it and they have final cut. And, you know, it's just, let's follow this person around as they do awesome stuff. Like that's not, <laughs> that's not what we weren't interested in that, you know? Yeah. It was definitely more interesting than that. Well, going back to obviously to weather veins, I want to ask about some specific songs from this one. I got a list right here. So there's, uh, I think it's uh, a line in white Beretta where you talk about, it sort of ties into everything we're talking about. You say I was raised to be a strong and silent, southern man and i think like a uh, cast iron skillet sort of like touches on similar themes about you know not to use the cliche term but you know the idea of toxic masculinity i think one of the reasons why you have such yeah. great fans particularly in the country world is that you know you're sort of you you aren't always showing yourself at your strongest you know like mm -hmm. can you talk just a little bit about like those two songs and kind of like tearing down like the worst parts of your upbringing or the culture you were in and sort of like evolving from that, which I think is an important thing to talk about. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tough to do, you know, because you get so used to romanticizing this idea of the past and us Southerners are very guilty of that, you know, um, and you sort of cruise through your life and, and, and you try to put on this sort of facade of, masculinity like i am you know i'm tough i'm a big strong man from the south i can handle anything nothing bothers me i'm here to provide and protect and and then you know once you start really thinking about what that means um you know to protect the people around you well first thing you should do is protect them from from you you know and protect mm. them from your your uh impulses and and your inability to handle your emotional life and uh you know, I think it's it's at the end of the day, I feel braver and stronger when I've done something that is not traditionally seen as masculine. When I've done something that's like, you know, I saw a problem that needed solving, so I solved it if I could. And, you know, sometimes that problem was me. Sometimes it was me not being really good at expressing how I felt. And if you don't acknowledge those emotions, uh, for what they are and and say them out loud and they're gonna come out as something different and I know a whole bunch of people you know I was lucky enough I, I had you know I have a really good dad and we we're close and have always been but you know I, I, I grew up around a lot of people who were just sort of existing under the tyranny of their big old redneck father and uh, 
that's tough, man. That's a tough way to live. And, and nobody's happy in that situation, including the big redneck father. Everybody's miserable because nobody's acknowledging really how they truly feel on a day-to-day basis. Um, I think I'm, I'm trying to maybe show people uh, an example of what has worked for me and something that's worked for me as far as keeping me happy and keeping my relationships healthy, um, helping me move through the world in a way that is intentional is letting go of these ideas of, you know, what's, uh, what's a man's role and what's a woman's role and, you know, mm-hmm. how you're supposed to behave and uh, just, you know, fuck all that. Let's not, let's not do all that. Let's just do what needs to be done and be kind to people. And, you know, if the dishes are dirty, wash the dishes, you know, if the, if the, if the towels need fold and fold the towel, whatever it is, if your wife makes more money than you, you know, you should try to make up for that by cleaning up around the house. It doesn't matter which one of you is the man and which one of you is a woman. It's really silly. You just do what needs to be done and you be nice, you know. (laughs) <laughs> just want to give you a round of applause you. for that. I think Thank a lot of you. people will enjoy hearing you say that. You talked about sort of the idea of nostalgia just a second ago. And I've read in other interviews you've done that you like hate nostalgia. You hate, and it is interesting because I do think when you're talking specifically the South, that probably was, uh, you know, to, to go there, like one of the reasons why the election of 2016 went the way it did make them you know make america great again it's actually probably why brexit happened in england this idea that like the good old, old days were better mm-hmm. but we have this rosy lens of what the good old days were really like so can you talk to me a little bit about why in general you do not like nostalgia i think you called it an abomination in another interview yeah I read yours. yeah i think it is i think you know we have a memory for a reason um and i think a big part of that reason is to look at the mistakes that we've made in the past like you know early if we're all in a cave um you know and and it's it's tens of thousands of years ago and we're trying to figure out how to find something to eat um it's going to serve us really well if we remember exactly where the food is you know <laughs> what i mean not like think in our mind some sort of fuzzy idea of the food is in that direction and it was great. And if we just walk in that direction again, there'll be more food. That's a good way to starve to death. You got to know exactly where the food is if you're in the cave. And fast forward to now and we look back at the past and we think, well, yeah, a lot of bad stuff happened. But, you know, really, it was a beautiful, idyllic situation where our family was all happy and everybody had money and everybody had a job. And and then you think, well, maybe it was that way for you. I mean, probably not entirely, but, you know, even let's accept that it was that way for you and your family. What about the people down the street? You know, what, are people, what about the people a block over? What about the people a mile away? And once you start digging into that, the idea that everyone should be part of the community, not just, you know, white people or straight people or men or, you know, once you accept that everybody's in the community, the average level of happiness with the past starts to drop extremely quickly. And you see, well, maybe from your perspective, the past was a better place, but in general, it most certainly was not, definitely not in America. Um, Yeah, and the only way to ever get there is to look at it with some sort of honesty. And uh, nostalgia does not have a whole lot of honesty to it. That just has this sort of foggy, it's kind of like the refusal to look at things the way they really were. And I don't, I'm not into that, man. I want tomorrow to be good. You know, I, yesterday, I don't have any more use for it unless it's just to help tomorrow to get better. Do you have any um, funny or not so funny stories for that matter about sort of being told by the industry or whoever that you're too woke and should tone it down? Cause I saw like a really funny thing the other day where you, tweeted something uh, in favor of pride and mm-hmm. there was some fan that like replied i'm canceling tickets to your show i'm so disappointed in you just it reminded me at the time that like someone got mad at like tom morello from rage against the machine for being right. political in a tweet because i'm like are you not familiar with this artist that you're just yeah. figuring this out now but do you have yeah. any stories like that about especially earlier in your career when because you always been so outspoken where people were like you know shut up and sing don't go there. You're going to alienate the country fans, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, you know, one, well, there was one situation where the, the, the biggest one I think was the feral hog moment on Twitter, you know, because that was, 
I guess I was in some ways responsible for that. I, I, there had been a school shooting and of course I was frustrated just like most people. And, and, you know, the, the argument was the definition of an assault weapon. Like how do you set, how do you describe an assault weapon in a way that clearly defines it? And this is all nonsense. I mean, we know what those things are. We know what an assault weapon is. And and that was my, my tweet. My message was that, you know, if you're on here arguing the, the, the definition of an assault weapon, you're part of the problem. Like, you know what those guns are. You don't need one of those guns. It's pretty simple. And then there was a fellow from Arkansas, Willie McNabb from Arkansas, who chimed in about the hogs, 30 to 50 feral hogs that were invading his yard uh, while his children were playing. And this became a huge viral tweet. And, you know, he was responding to me and, and, I said, you know, man, if you've got if you've got that many hogs uh, running into your yard, you've got problems that an assault weapon are not going to solve. You know, not to mention, like, are you firing on the hogs while your children are playing in the middle of like, are the kids there, too? How do you hit the hogs and not hit the children? You know, have you thought about fences? It, there's, there's so many ways you could go with that. But some people genuinely got mad. Um and, uh, you know, Ben Shapiro, the, the little conservative man, um, uh, tried to tell me that I, I didn't know what I was talking about. And I, I told him I've owned I've owned those weapons. I grew up in Alabama. You know, I said, where did where did you grow up? You know, because I fired them. I take them apart and clean them and put them back together. Um, and I know that they're, you know, useless. And that was the last I'd heard from him. He just sort of stepped away, which he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't normally do. So I was, I was pretty happy about that moment. I got the little guy to shut up. So that made me pretty happy, yeah. but, um, it's probably but helpful. The hogs, that, yeah. I'm the sorry. hogs was the biggest, that was the most, most popular thing I did in my whole career. All these years of writing songs and tweeting about feral hogs was the, the, the most viral thing I've ever done. <laughs> oh, probably is helpful that, uh, I mean, that's a good story. Oh, it's, but it's probably helpful that you're kind of coming from the point of view of not a coastal elite or someone, but someone who's yeah lived that life. Well, that brings me, I'm running, I'm so sad. I'm running out of time because I could talk to you forever. You're so wonderful to talk to you. But since we, you know, I hate to end things on kind of a sad note, but to bring it back yeah. to weather veins and, and to school shootings, I do want to ask you about this, the song Save the World, because I've read uh, that that was maybe the hardest song for you to write on the album. And I'd, I'd love for you to speak about that. Yeah, it was tough. It's it's such a heavy topic, you know, something I've noticed about my songwriting uh, that I hadn't really noticed up until this album is that when I'm writing about something that's kind of universal and pretty well understood, like love or death and kids and these kind of things, I'll write, you know, sometimes from a another character's perspective sometimes i'll it'll be more of a storytelling kind of song where i'm not necessarily the 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 person that is speaking in the song but when i'm talking about something like this that's so serious and so heavy i have to come at it from my own personal point of view and i can't you know i wouldn't i would never assume the perspective of somebody who's been involved in a mass shooting so i have to go from well this is how this makes me feel and uh, it was tough because I, I started out being broad and sort of vague about these concepts. And and I sang this song for Amanda and she said, yeah, that's not you need to you need to rewrite that because that's your, I know what you're trying to say, but you haven't said it yet. So you need to get specific and really dig in. And that was terrifying for me, but I did it. And, you know, the last thing that I did was go back in the studio and record the, a whole new vocal to this song, which is the one that's on the the track now um, with new lyrics and it made a lot more sense and it was just a matter of me sort of you know she helped me kind of push over that hill of here's what I want to say but I don't I, I I don't know if I feel comfortable saying it well I had to I had to push harder and you know get out of my comfort zone and and write more specifically and more pointedly it was it was tough but it's hard to argue with somebody saying here's how I feel you know, that's, that's, that's a hard point. You can't say you don't feel that way, or you're not afraid of this happening. Um, so I think it works best when I do it that way. I know, like I said, I'm running out of time, uh, which bumps me out, but I want to end it on, you know, a, a kind of a positive note in that you, at the beginning of this interview said, you always played the character yourself, but you're going to be in Killers of the Flower Moon playing someone else. Yes, uh, playing somebody Swiss else. Martin Scorsese film. I'd love to hear a little bit about that because I, it's my understanding you actually wrote a lot of, or some of the songs from Weather Veins 
on the set. So I don't know if that lent it a cinematic quality or a narrative that's a little different. Just in general, I'd love to hear a little bit what to expect and how that ties into the record. You know, the movie's going to be amazing. I, I haven't seen it yet, but but everybody there was the best at their job. And they were all so very helpful to me. And I was very grateful for that experience. Um, but there was a whole lot of sitting around and waiting to, to go to work. Because we were in Oklahoma, we were in the summer, the weather can get really nasty. And I, I had some guitars there, so I started writing some songs. And I think they were informed a lot by the place that I was in because I was I was in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, a very small town. It reminded me a whole lot of where I grew up in Alabama. The people were very similar to the people that I'd grown up around. And um it got me thinking about their personal lives and the stories of those folks. And and that's where the songs started to come from. And then when I got back in the studio, I, I kind of brought with me the way I'd seen Scorsese work on set, because he was there every day. He was involved in every scene. He was working hard the whole time. This is a very old man, and it was very hot outside, and he worked really hard. I was impressed. But the thing that stuck with me the most was the fact that he had this sort of overall vision for how he wanted the story to be told, but he was also open to collaborate with the people that were around him. And if somebody had a suggestion or an idea, he would listen. And that surprised me. I thought you know, either he's not going to be there or he's going to be a dictator. And he was neither of those things. He was just trying to get the story told in the best way possible. And so I, I took that with me when I got back in the studio. And I thought, you know, it doesn't mean that you're not in charge if you're listening to the people around you. 